want you to hit me as hard as you can. Before superhero movies came out every other month, making a film based on a comic book was considered juvenile and impossible. Then came Superman the movie, proving that superheroes could be done on the silver screen, with not only thrilling sequences and fantastic effects, but with grace and sincerity. But with Superman 2, a lesson in Hollywood hubris was given, but not learned. Egos and superheroes, loyalties and royalties, doomed a franchise just as it begun to fly. Begging the question, what the f happened to this movie? In 1974, European producer Alexander Salkind and his son Ilya purchased the film rights to Superman. The Salkind's reputation in the film industry was notorious. To give you an idea of their less than reputable business practices, in 1973, they produced a four-hour version of The Three Musketeers. Directed by Richard Lester, the film was too long to be put into theaters, and the Salkinds decided to cut the film in two and release The Four Musketeers a year later. However, they only paid the cast and crew for one film, leading to an onslaught of lawsuits. But the Salkinds were nothing if not ambitious. Spurred by the enormous success of Jaws, they knew blockbusters were the future, and their ticket to the big time was Superman. Outside of the many Zorro films and the campy Batman movie in 1966, a big budget, serious take on a comic book had never been done before. And no, Superman and the Mole Men doesn't count. And from the very start, the Salkinds envisioned Superman as a two film epic. To Warner Brothers, that was a huge risk. To give the Salkins credit, they saw I guess, the future in making a film out of Superman, which nobody did. Warners actually owned DC Comics. They could have made it any time they wanted to. Nobody thought that this would make a very good picture. Warner Brothers gave the Salkinds a negative pickup deal, which meant the Salkinds had to make the entire film themselves, and once it was completed, Warner Brothers would pay them back. This allowed Warner Brothers to shoulder the blame on the Salkinds if the film turned out to be a complete turd. The Salkinds were off to the races, approaching every A-list writer and director in Hollywood that would sit down with them. Their first win was Godfather writer Mario Puzo, who delivered a table-breaking 500-page script. Then after people like Francis Ford Coppola and Steven Spielberg turned down directing duties, the Salkinds booked four-time James Bond director Guy Hamilton. Next, it was on to casting. In the beginning of 1975, the Salkinds scored a meeting with Marlon Brando, he demanded a record-breaking $3.7 million to star as Jor-El, and an insane 11% of the box office gross. The Salkinds didn't care, because with Brando's name attached, the film had clout. Marlon was the crystal that made this the crystal, like in the film, that made this happen, okay? Because the moment Marlon Brando said yes, Gene Ackman wants to be in the picture, Warner Brothers very quickly said, we want the picture for you of the United States, pick up guarantee, and that was, the picture was off, the picture was gone. The Salkinds hit their first snag when determining which country would be the cheapest to shoot in. At first it was set for Italy, but Brando couldn't film there since he had a warrant for his arrest because of the rape scene from Last Tango in Paris. If production moved to England, it would save them millions, but Hamilton couldn't direct because he fled the country to avoid paying taxes. A real classy group, these guys. The Salkinds chose Brando over Hamilton and moved production to the legendary Pinewood Studios in England. The search for a new director began. While Robert Benton, with husband and wife duo David and Leslie Newman, were hired for rewrites, bringing the script down to a still massive 400 pages. In January 1977, the Salkinds chose Richard Donner to direct Superman after enjoying his hit film, The Omen. I was sitting on the toilet on a Sunday morning, and the phone rang, and this strange Hungarian voice said, this is Alexander Salkai. I'm making Superman. I said, well, that's great. I would like you to direct it. He said, it's two pictures. He said, I'll pay you a million dollars. I said, hey, how are you? You know, where do you live, and how do I get to you? And so, overnight, my life turned around. Because Brando had an unmovable shooting date, Donner had only 11 weeks to prepare. Despite that, he decided to completely overhaul the two pitchers. He immediately ditched the script with its overly goofy tone, as he felt it didn't respect the creation of Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. Donner believed that Superman was a true piece of Americana, and he deserved to be treated like the American icon he was. 
Donner enlisted his friend and five-time James Bond scribe, Tom Mankiewicz, to help rewrite the script. Donner instructed Mankiewicz to make the love story work, then everything else would fall into place. Though he rewrote most of the script, the Writers Guild refused to credit Mankiewicz, so Donner gave him a creative consultant credit. The Salkinds still wanted a big star for Clark Kent, but with Brando and Hackman fully on board, this allowed Donner some freedom. He maintained that the audience wouldn't believe someone like Robert Redford flying around as the Man of Steel. In came the unknown, 6'5 theater actor Christopher Reeve. They screen tested Reeve in February of 1977. In the suit, he was a skinny 170 pounds and was sweating like crazy. But the moment he came on screen, Donner and the rest instantly knew it had to be him. Reeve trained with bodybuilder and Darth Vader himself, David Prowse, to put on 40 pounds of muscle. By the time they started shooting, Reeve was Superman. Hey, Jim! Woo! Excuse me. That's a bad outfit! Production began in March of 1977, and immediately it was clear how much Donner had on his plate. Since they were doing two films at once, they would film on one set every scene they needed for Superman 1 and 2 before moving on to the next location. Filming was exhausting, and keeping the continuity straight was a mental jigsaw puzzle. Throughout, Donner kept morale up with jokes and pranks, and always making time on set fun. Donner's most difficult task was getting the audience to believe that Superman could fly. All the tests that were done prior to coming on, which apparently cost the Salkinds millions, were laughable. Dummies being shot out of cannons, gliders shaped like soups, and even traditional animation. It took a year and a half to get it right, but they figured it out with a combination of advanced wire rigs and a complicated front projection system, both invented for the film. It worked so well, the whole marketing campaign was designed around the phrase, you will believe a man can fly. Quickly the Salkinds returned to their corner cutting ways. The two of them and producer Pierre Spangler hassled Donner on a daily basis, saying he was behind schedule and over budget. But Donner said he never got a budget during his entire time on the project. Warner Brothers loved what they were seeing in the dailies, so when the Salkinds came to them about running out of money, the two parties negotiated TV rights and international distribution. The Salkinds' whole MO was to make cash cows out of their productions, and the more money Warner Brothers gave them, the more they lost control in royalties. They took these frustrations out on Donner, who in turn grew to hate the Salkinds, and especially Spangler. It got so bad, I just, I couldn't talk to them. I just, I couldn't stand the sight of them, quite honestly. And I, just, you know, stay away from me. Stay off the goddamn set. In July, the Salkinds brought in director Richard Lester to be a go-between Donner and the producers. Lester was still mid-lawsuit with the Salkinds over not receiving full compensation for his work on the Musketeer films. Rumoredly, he made some devil's bargain with the Salkinds, held production on Superman, in return, he would be paid the money he was owed. But the Salkinds have since admitted that they deliberately wanted someone in place in the event that they did fire Donner or he quit. This obviously created anxiety on the set. At any point, Donner could be gone. While his actors and main creative crew rallied around him as they all had grown very close, he hid the conflicts from them. It was a lonely period, it was a long period, it was tiring, it was exhausting. But I had taken on the project of making Superman, and damn it, nothing was going to stop me. As production moved into 1978, they realized they could possibly release part one in June, just in time for the 40th anniversary of Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman. But the money was actually starting to run out. It was decided to focus solely on one film, because if the first film was a bomb, they would never be able to finish the second. Production lasted 19 months, ending in October of 1978. At that point, Donner had completed part one, and had 75% of part two in the can. The planned ending of part one was Superman throwing the nuke into space, which explodes, releasing Zod and his minions from their prison. They begin flying towards Earth, cut to black, Roll credits. 
But what if they teased a sequel that no one wanted? The original ending of Part 2 was Lois Lane's death, followed by Superman reversing time. Since most of the effects were completed for the sequence, and it cost so much to do, they decided to place this finale into Part 1, just in case Part 2 didn't happen. The Salkinds never let Donner preview the film for a test audience, so the first showing was its premiere, with President Jimmy Carter in attendance. Siegel and Schuster were invited to the premiere, and at the end of the premiere, they both came over and just thanked me profusely and was crying, and I got caught up in it. It was the most moving moment I think I've ever had in the business and will ever have. On December 15th, 1978, the most expensive film ever made, Superman the Movie, hit theaters, and it took the world by storm. While today's audience will find the film a bit of a bore, and most of the effects have not aged well, at the time, Superman was delightfully inspiring and a sight to behold. And to this day, John Williams' iconic score is synonymous with the superhero. It was number one at the box office for 13 straight weeks, making a total of 134 million in the United States. Adjusted for inflation, it's still the highest grossing Superman film. And it won an Oscar for those visual effects, by the way. Even now, the film is widely considered the blueprint to how to make a superhero origin film. I was very, very, very proud of the picture, and not in its size and the fact that it was the number one for winners or any of that stuff. The fact that we pulled this off, that an audience sat in that theater and they got the same charge I did when I sat in dailies and I saw Christopher Reeve fly from one end of the stage to the other, and people went, oh, and they just sucked in their breath. And I just was very fulfilling. In the early part of 1979, as Superman continued its box office domination, the Salkinds began prepping for Superman 2. Donner and Mankiewicz came up with a new ending for the film and even had ideas for sequels. However, the feud between Donner and the Salkinds had spilled into the public. Variety ran an article saying that Donner would not return if Pierre Spangler remained a producer. He also attacked the Salkinds' decision to remove Brando entirely from part two to avoid paying his 11% of the grosses. Despite all the money and accolades Superman 1 earned, the Salkinds chose Spangler over Donner. I mean, I was ready to go and I get a telegram one day. It says, your services will no longer be needed. Richard Lester was taking over. The Salkinds' ultimate gamble finally came to fruition. With Donner gone, Lester could finish part two with minimal fuss. Nobody disliked Richard Lester. I mean, Richard Lester's like a wonderful director, but the point was that Richard Lester came in to do a very complicated gig. He knew we were all in love with Richard Donner. The Sorkins had chosen him because they knew that he was an economic director who could bring things in on budget. Most of the creative team did not return. Cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth unfortunately died shortly before Superman 1 had come out, as did production designer John Barry the following year. Mankiewicz was asked to return, but didn't out of respect for Donner, requiring the Salkinds to bring back David and Leslie Newman for rewrites. The duo had to create a new beginning and ending, adding the Eiffel Tower terrorist attack and Superman's memory-wiping kiss. 75% of Part 2 had already been completed by Donner, but for Lester to receive full directing credit, he had to have shot 50%. So when production started up again in September of 1979, Lester had two goals. Finish the scenes not yet filmed, such as the villain's arrival in the Midwest and the climactic battle in Metropolis, and reshoot sequences so he could earn his directing credit. The Newmans, as Margot Kidder put it, hastily rewrote the Niagara Falls scenes for this purpose, including how Lois tests Clark then ultimately discovering his secret. With Brando out, his scenes were replaced with Superman's mother, and Hackman declined returning for pickups, forcing Lester to use a body and voice double for Lex Luthor. Lester also didn't share Donner's vision for a mythical epic, stating that he preferred quirky and silly, hence why the movie is chock full of jokes and sight gags. He also added all those random ass powers Superman has, like the saran wrap and that kiss. Lester went as far as shooting inserts into Donner's scenes so he could hit his 50%. All of this made filming a bit awkward and workmanlike. You know, Dick, with Dick Donner, you find things. You know, there's, there's a family to it. 
Richard Lester came in, there, there was nothing close to a family atmosphere. Production finished in March of 1980. The final edit of the movie preserves about 30 to 40 percent of Donner's original footage. Warner Brothers attempted to get Donner a co-directing credit, but he simply replied, I don't share credit. John Williams came back to discuss scoring the film, but when the Salkinds left him and Lester in a room together, they got into a fight. Williams walked out saying, he could not get along with this man. Ken Thorne replaced him. Superman 2 released on December 4th, 1980. Back then, it received great reviews, some calling it better than the first, even Reeve himself. Now, the behind the scenes drama highlights the issues of the film, with most considering it inferior to the original. The film still did well, making 108 million in the United States, but its international release struggled a bit, thanks to the competition of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Over two decades after its initial release, editor Michael Tho was working on the restoration of Superman the movie for the DVD release in 2001. During the project, he discovered hours of lost footage from both films inside the Warner Brothers vault. For years, Warner Brothers received thousands of letters and were hounded by multiple fan sites, asking them to release a Donner cut of Superman 2. Sound familiar? Tho began floating the idea of having Donner recut the film to Warner Brothers, who were interested. However, legal issues kept it from being a reality. Five years later, Brian Singer worked with Brando's estate to use the unused footage of the actor to be placed in Superman Returns, using some CG trickery. This opened the door for Warner Brothers to ask about using his discarded scenes for the Donner cut. As Thou said, if that footage couldn't be used, it wasn't worth doing the project. Luckily, they said yes. In the tail end of 2005, Thou started working on the new version, but it took nearly six months to get Donner to join the project. Along with Makowitz, they provided feedback as Thou went along. When we did find the footage, and it took months and months and months, Dick came over and saw all the scenes. Um, he also didn't want to deal too much with the luster scenes that needed to be left in to make a complete story. But I realized after a while that he had been familiar with those scenes and they hurt him, I think. Uh, that, that was always a sore spot. A lot of the editing by Thou involved a painstaking process of uncutting original negatives to reconstruct the film. They also completed nearly 200 effect shots, deliberately made to look like the late 70s. Reconstructing this film is not only rare, but it's probably unique in film history. The Donner Cut removes most of Lester's slapstick moments and contains multiple scenes never before seen. The original opening with Lois figuring out Clark's identity by drawing on a picture of Superman, then jumping out of a window hoping he'd prove her right, and everything with Brando, which gives Soup's decision to become human so much more weight. Donner and Tho even used a screen test where Lois uses a gun on Clark because the scene was never shot. You realize, of course, if you'd been wrong, Clark Kent would have been killed. Was it blank? The one thing they didn't have was an ending. It was either Lester's hypno-kiss, or return to the script's original ending of Superman turning back time. They went with the latter, and it's clearly less polished and a sore spot for this version. Superman 2, The Richard Donner Cut, released on November 28, 2006 on DVD. Undoing a nearly three decade old mistake. In the Salkind's short sighted plan of choosing money over quality, they sabotaged the very franchise they wanted to build. Thankfully, Warner Brothers gave Richard Donner a second chance at Superman, allowing closure for him and the millions of his fans that questioned what if. Since then, Superman, the patron saint of comic books, has been treated with the utmost care and respect that I can't even finish this sentence. Superman on an airplane.